You are listening to Keep Canada Weird, a weekly weird news roundup by the Nighttime Podcast. Hello, listeners, and welcome back to the weekly Keep Canada Weird discussion series. If you're new here, Keep Canada Weird is the venue in which my pal Aaron Airport and I seek out and explore the more offbeat Canadian news stories from the past week. In tonight's episode, which we recorded on the evening of November 1st, 2023, Aaron and I take off our masks, blow out our jack-o'-lanterns, and come to terms with a world no longer wrapped in Halloween's dark lace. We're going to cover an obligatory case of booby-trapped candy, this time in Timmins, Ontario. We're going to hear about a legal bat infestation in Saskatchewan, and we'll spend far too much time on the story of a break-in at a BC business involving a biohazard in a bathtub. And, well, yeah, we also get a death threat. Let's get into this. Handsome Aaron Airport. We survived another Halloween. The teenagers didn't kill us. Uh, my pumpkin is still intact on my front step, and my house remains unegged. How did you make out? Uh, also unegged. Any mischief on your property? No, no mischief that I saw. But um, I had, I had a record-breaking year this year for oh. trick or treaters. Okay, because that's something we talked about. You usually get next to yeah. no children near Old Man Airport's house. Uh, this yeah. year they showed up. Well, the, this is my this was my third Halloween here. The first year I had four kids. Mm. Last year I had zero kids. This year, I had six kids. Six of them. Yeah. Yep. Wow. Uh, the weather was, I don't know about down in Cape Breton, but here in Halifax, the weather was pretty good for trick-or-treating. Maybe that's yep. what um, led to the other two or three kids showing up at Old Man Airport's place. Yes, yes. And I was kind of watching the flow of traffic from my window last night. And as I did see a few trick-or-treaters milling about, they were kind of staying to the other side of the street. Mm. Uh, so you know how sometimes in a neighborhood, um, there are certain sides of the street that maintain most of the traffic? Yeah. The place where you live now, I don't believe either side of the street has a sidewalk. That's so that... right. There's no sidewalk at all. So, But I think it really depends on like coming around the corner sticking to that side of the street and they and they look across and like um it's an empty lot next to me on one mm. side the house on the other side of me he's always away this time of year so okay. his place is in darkness so i think they kind of make a judgment call when they're over there and and a few will come over like you know six obviously came over i think if the kids that were on the other side if all of them came over uh, I probably might have gotten 15 kids. Like that was probably okay. the extent of how many kids were in the, in the neighborhood last night. Okay. I didn't do a full tally, but I'm thinking I had upwards of a hundred, um, a lot of great costumes. My favorite costumes that I saw were, um, a kid dressed in like, I guess as if you were working in like a toxic waste, like hazardous material kind of site, he had like kind of like a hazmat suit. He had that on, but it was all like kind of damaged as if something went wrong at the chemical site or something. Uh, his suit, his costume was really cool. Um, he was dressed up as an extra from the HBO show uh, Chernobyl. Chernobyl. Yeah, that's that was kind of the vibe, but it also had a bit of an 80s look too because it was neon green. <laughs> so yeah, it's, yeah. It's just a neat yeah. costume. Um, but yeah, that, that was probably my, and then of course my own children were my other favorite costumes. I had a five-year-old Michelangelo from the Ninja Turtles and a 11-year-old Gengar, the, which is a Pokemon character. Uh, uh, it's a Pokemon character. Yeah. Cause I was very ignorant when I saw your Instagram story uh, of your children trick-or-treating and I just said, oh, he's a dinosaur. No, no, that is Gengar, the Pokemon. Um, yeah, all in sorry. all, though, I had an amazing Halloween. Uh, out of 10, I'm going to give it a perfect 10, just like the other 42 Halloweens I had. Uh, what do you give yours out of 10? Oh, I give it a 10 out of 10. I was really, after last year when I had zero kids, I was really expecting the same this year. Mm -hmm. And I felt almost foolish buying candy and, and making up treat bags again. Mm -hmm. 
you know, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice. Yeah. I buy 40 bags of chips. <laughs> for yourself and your cash. For myself, yeah. Um, my only do differently for next year is I've decided that I'm going to take it upon myself um and maybe take one for the neighborhood team and i'm going to put on a fireworks display next year that was something my dad did when i was a kid after everyone was done trick-or-treating we'd have fireworks on our front lawn uh, cape breton is noticeably a bigger uh halloween is noticeably a bigger deal in cape breton than it is here in halifax so i'm going to try to infuse a little bit of that uh, 1980s cape breton halloween excitement into my neighborhood starting next year where i'm mm. going to go all out with a fireworks display to cap the whole thing off the but, only thing i'll say to that is fireworks are my least favorite part of halloween really i as a kid i was i looked forward to it so much i was a pyromaniac for one thing though like i love yeah, seeing yeah. my dad like blow up the front lawn yeah yeah for sure that <laughs> when you're a child yeah it is entertaining uh as an adult all i think about is the animals in the neighborhood oh. who hate the sound of fireworks and get scared mm. um that's so. a perfect segue because I've been thinking about the animals and I think the reason I'm thinking about animals so much is so many listeners of this show of uh, members of keep Canada weird nation uh, or members of the keep Canada weird army have um, put themselves on the front lines of, I guess, weird stories across the country and are volunteering to be keep Canada weird correspondents. We've heard from many over the last few episodes. And we got volunteer a is the key word there. Yeah, I can't stress that enough that it is a hundred percent volunteer. Uh, well, slow down. I will send candy to people. If people volunteer, send a voice memo. Uh, be a correspondent for Keep Canada Weird. I uh, include your address in an email afterwards. And yes, I will send you a candy and a Keep Canada Weird sticker or something. But make sure that. Uh, come tax time that you claim that candy and sticker because every bit of it and the stamp absolutely let's hear from some correspondents and then we'll get right into the belly of the beast of weird canadiana the first correspondent we're going to hear is shinoa who's reporting to us from across the border it's snowing here today in halifax i have a feeling it's not snowing where shinoa is uh, calling in from listen to this Hello, Jordan and handsome Aaron Airport. This is Shinoa from the lower 48, Texas to be specific. I wanted to tell you about the animal uprising my family has experienced. About a year ago, we had a sly fox come into our backyard and take our puppy's new toy right from under her nose. She was sleeping on the back porch when Swiper the fox took her toy. This fox had to climb a chain link fence to get into our backyard. We have no idea how this fox got the toy out of the backyard. The only video footage we have of the fox taking the toy shows the fox walking to the fence and then it was gone. This wasn't just any old toy. This was a new right out of the package toy. It was made of hard plastic and round about the size of a large bagel. I'm happy to pass on this footage if you want to see it. I have a story about scorpions in the house, but that's a story for another day. Side note, we don't have Tim Hortons in Texas but I imagine they are about as good as Starbucks. Not good at all. Overpriced and overbrewed. If I am fortunate enough to receive some Canadian candy, please note I'm allergic to chocolate, but I am happy to review anything you send. I truly enjoy listening to your podcast with all the weird news from Canada. It makes living in America seem almost normal. Hugs to you, Jordan, and a high five to you, Aaron, since I know you do not enjoy hugs. My email address is... <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to end it there. Uh, I don't know why I support it. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I set that up perfectly, not knowing uh, Shinoa was going to end with a request for treats that aren't chocolate. Before we comment yeah. on her on her story, what could I send her? I guess like some kind of gummies? Ketchup chips? Yeah, absolutely. Easy. Going yeah. down to Texas. Um, Ketchup chips. And, I'd, and, I, and I'll say too, um, rather than a high five, I'll take an elbow bump. Mm, very, I like those uh, better, yeah, because the high five is is direct contact with a germy hand. Yeah, do you want COVID, Shanoa? Because Aaron may have it. 
I might have it. I am sick right now, so you don't yeah. want to even touch my elbow. Stick with the elbow, my hand. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, let's comment on her on her report here. So I'm glad she didn't scare share a scorpion tail because those things are frightening. I'm glad here in Canada the, the nastiest bugs we have are June bugs, which are those beetles that come out every June. Um, mm -hmm. But we've talked about the animal uprising and what role kind of household pets would play in that. We don't believe dogs or cats are involved. And if they are, they seem to be favoring uh, or rooting for humans to come out as the dominant species at the end of this. Mm -hmm. A fox is pretty close to a dog. Where do you think foxes would fall in this? They are dog well, foxes. Well, no, they are, but they are fully on the animal side of the animal uprising. Uh, anything that's not domesticated is part of the animal uprising so this is a, an act of microaggression by fox against her domesticated dog taking well, his toy it, yeah it's proof that the animals are treating domesticated dogs and cats they're sending them a message as well and saying you may you may be from our family but we know whose side you're truly on uh, the feeders, that's the side that you're on, and we're coming for you too. Mm. So don't think that you're going to get any favors once we retake the planet and you'll be down in the bunkers with the humans chewing Ouch. on canned, you know, clam chowder. Just cans. Just the cans, yeah, because you forgot your can opener. Okay, we have another uh, correspondent. We're going to get to that a little later. We got to get into the stories here. The clock is ticking. Uh, Canada is not going to keep itself weird without our help. So let's get into it. We have a collection of interesting stories that played out over the last week. With uh, We're recording this on November 1st, the day after Halloween. So we will, of course, have to tell an obligatory needle in candy story. This one out of Timmins, Ontario. We're going to hear about a bat infestation in Saskatchewan. We'll hear about a, th a death threat in the form of a salmon carcass. And then we're going to talk about how a break-in in, in British Columbia ended in a biohazard in a bathtub. That is a lot of bees. BC break-in bathtub biohazard. Ah, a big black bug bit, a big black bear, and the big black bear bled blue black blood. Let's get into it. All right. This episode is going to kind of walk us out of being in the holiday spirit with Halloween you know, now behind us. So I think if we follow the thread of the stories in the way I laid them out, it will do that. If we go from Halloween candy to bats, death threats, and then get into weird Canadian crime, it's like going to ease us out of Halloween stories. So let's start with the obligatory needle in candy in Timmins. Before we hear the story, let me just ask you what you gave for treats. I think you told me you made little like uh, like treat bags, individual treats. Yeah, bags. yeah. I make a, I get a like is your standard Ziploc bag. Okay. And they got a bag of chips. Well, they were cheesies. Um, so a bag of cheesies, uh, a chocolate bar, which was the, which was either like a coffee crisp or a Kit Kat. Um, a uh, package of nibs, mm, you know, the, can't go wrong with that. Yeah. And a package of sour candy gummies things. Okay. So everything was very safe packaged. There was no risk for anybody. Mm. Um, during my trick or treating with both my kids, I don't think we, I don't think they got anything homemade or anything that wasn't packaged. Uh, so I did feel pretty good about what they brought home. We did a, a tradition I had since I was a kid and my kids carry this on is we get home, we lay all their treats out on the ground and they sort them like they put all the chips together, all the bars together and count them. And that's kind of my unofficial opportunity to kind of give them a once over being like, you know, is there like something weird in here, like, a, you know, homemade cookie or something like that? Because if there was, I wouldn't have let my kids eat it. And the reason for that is I was brought up to fear and you were brought up to fear weird crap being put in apples and baked goods for the purpose I can only assume to either kill kids or terrify trick-or-treaters. Um, every year, it's like as soon as the lights go out on the doorsteps and trick-or-treating ends, it seems like stories start popping up 
of some kid ate weed gummies, some kid got a razor blade and an apple. The first story like that that I came upon this year happened in Timmins, Ontario, and it involves needles found in candy. Listen to the news report, then we'll chat it out. A warning tonight about Halloween candy in our region that appears to have been tampered with. Timmins police say they're in receipt of a reported piece of candy in which a needle had been discovered inside a wrapped chocolate bar. Investigators are asking parents to observe all collected candy for quality control and personal safety. They add this is a high priority investigation. We've got a list of the streets the young girl visited on our website, ctvnewsnorthernontario.ca. So short and sweet news coverage, but I guess that's a story you don't even really need to tell. Like as soon as you mention it, everyone knows what's going on. Uh, it happens every year. Last year, we were fortunate to have followed one of these stories from start to finish. You remember the, uh, I think it was nerds that were infused with THC. Yeah, they eventually... yeah the, the weed candies yeah. that uh, this Since... older couple we're giving out on their streets inexplicably and they were arrested so we got to see that come full circle yeah 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 but this one um i went to the to the website that was mentioned in the article and the family only trick-or-treated on like three or four different streets so they have a pretty good idea of where she would have got the candy in the article um if, if anyone is only listening and isn't seeing the visual the the candy it looked like a little like almost like a mars bar or something and they describe it as a needle but to me it looked like a big nail sticking through yeah. like yeah. it was i it wasn't something where a kid i don't think would accidentally eat that when you look at it you're like oh my god there's like a huge nail sticking out of that bar like it wasn't very um, it wasn't uh very discreet that's, that's for sure. the word it I was, was looking for. it was sticking right out pretty far out mm -hmm. of the bar mm -hmm. and it's such a traceable crime like to decide to do that like yeah everyone they don't really cover i mean some kids might cover a, a, a large span of of real estate um trick-or-treating and maybe it's harder to pinpoint but um and i wonder like is it just the one that they gave out or did they give out several of them and they haven't been noticed yet mm. When uh, I hear something like this, I always think there has to be more to that story. Not that I doubt that it that it happened or that this is legit, but I don't know. I said that last year as well, and I guess I was wrong because it turned out to be two just like wacky people that were giving out weed candy and were charged for it. So in this case, I wouldn't be surprised if it was, you know, like a teenager or something was it was involved in his candies, uh, in his home's candy uh, output and maybe thought it was funny to stick something that uh, stick something that obvious in it I, yeah so you're thinking maybe the parents or the owners of the house didn't even know possibly because it's ridiculous would, you'd have to rewrap it too uh i think the way that this appeared with the the they were described it as a needle sticking through the candy. It, it looked like almost as if you had, imagine a, a Mars bar wrapped in paper, like wrapped in its paper container or whatever packaging. And if you just stuck the night, the needle, like through it, yeah. Through so there's it. only a tiny little hole in the packaging. Yeah. But then when you open the bar or when you open the package, you see it. I don't think there would be based on what I saw that going around on the internet and in this article, it doesn't look like the kind of thing someone would accidentally eat unless they had their eyes closed and they were just mowing down chocolate, which, you know, I did this morning, which, yeah, we're all guilty of. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's, it's, it's again, the motivation to do something like this is skewed for me. I can't, really understand why somebody would want yeah. to do this why they think they wouldn't get caught like it just seems like such a risky crime to do yeah, risky uh, in terms of getting caught and also caught. hurting a kid yeah. and also hurting somebody yeah mm -hmm. uh, to, so I, I i don't know i it's there's again yeah like you say it's a lot of unanswered questions i think they'll get to the bottom of it though the timmins police are on it Yes, uh, I have all my trust and faith in the Timmins police. They haven't let me down. They haven't really done anything to me at all. So mm -hmm. I can't really say that anything bad about them. I'm going to give them a benefit of a doubt, though. You know, fool me once, yeah, shame I've on got you. All my, yeah, I've got all my support behind them. 
uh, I really hope they crack the case mm -hmm. and uh, find know, the the needle poker that did this heinous bar crime. Um, do you think this is going to be the last story like this that pops up? Keep in mind that I like we picked out these stories this morning, the day after Halloween. I I will hazard to guess that if I did some Googling right now, I'd probably find another story from somewhere in Canada of this happening somewhere else. It happens every what is year. The world, is the world tired of it, though? Are they tired of hearing about it? I don't know. Like, yes, think every so. year there's a somebody finds an, a, an axe in their O. Henry bar. And, like, mm. eye roll, you know. Yeah. Like, is, is, mm. is, it, is it just at this point in time in our lives... You know, ever since the 80s, when we were hearing about apples with razor blades, does anyone care anymore? Mm. How could you get a razor blade in an apple without someone noticing? Like, that would clearly make a bit a weird... Like, you could easily do it in a candy apple because you could... Oh, put the razor the, blade in. The razor in and then cover the apple in candy. Oh, okay. We should edit that out. That's good. That's too good. That would work. Uh, I don't like... Well, that's yeah, too bad. Well, that's evil. Yeah, yeah, but nobody accepts candy apples on Halloween anymore because that that ship has sailed for people yeah. who are looking to put sharp objects in delicious treats. Yeah, you're right. Um, well, those days are long behind us now. You have to find ways like this where you have a very small little needle that you can slip into mm -hmm. a Mars bar or mm -hmm. or uh, an almond joy. It's like an I did see I did see an almond joy in the pile. When they were showing the the news footage, it's like an arms race between like kids trick or treating and psychopaths trying to hurt kids and destroy Halloween. There will always be psychos, mm. and there will always be candy. Mm. A tale as old as time. Let's move on to a an ad, a Halloween adjacent story. This one doesn't directly involve Halloween, but it's easy to put Halloween and bats in the same um, cinematic universe. Uh, this is the story of a rather complicated bat infestation in Saskatchewan. Uh, to put it simply, a family in Saskatchewan is dealing with an infestation of bats inside their house. But the way it turns out, there's not a whole lot they can do about it because bats actually have the law on their side. Listen to this story. For the last year, Rochelle Swan and her family have been stuck with bats living in their roof. Last August is when it it, the, it began, and we uh, we ended up finding a live bat in our living room, and it's kind of just unfolded from there. At first, she thought it was a strange one-off occurrence, but when her family started hearing them in the walls and finding them in different rooms, it was clear there was a problem. But removing them isn't so easy as bats are a protected species as a result of a new disease that appeared across North America 20 years ago. It's a fungus that grows on their on their bodies, on their nose, on their wings, uh, and that fungus gives them this white appearance on their nose. So it's called white nose syndrome. And uh, it's only been around for about 20 years. And in that time, it has just wiped out bat populations. The bats have certain times of year when they can be relocated, but just getting access to them is an issue. Again, we don't have any access into, into the, the, the structure of the roof without taking the whole roof off. Swan says that could cost up to $100,000 and there's no insurance for bat exclusion. She contacted the Ministry of Environment for guidance. In an email to CTV News, the ministry says, quote, bats can only be excluded, allowing exit but not re-entry, from buildings in May or September with a permit under Saskatchewan's bat exclusion policy. Outside of May or September, considerations will be made by the Ministry of Environment on a case-by-case -case basis. There's currently no provincial program to assist property owners with bat exclusion costs. The ministry is currently working towards a solution with the homeowner. Riskin says it can be a difficult job to keep bats out once they know how to get in. The challenge is if you have a big building like that, there are a lot of spots a bat can get in. And the, the rule of thumb is if you can fit your thumb through the hole, a bat can crawl through that hole. So imagine trying to seal up every thumb sized hole in most people's roofs. It's just not feasible. A GoFundMe has been started to assist the family with the costs of relocating the bats. <laughs> That's a complicated mess. You, you've heard about yeah. this white fungus bat infest uh, this bat disease that's happening you know what i've never heard of it no, yeah, I've, no. It, it's come up a few times in things that i've read but 
basically there's there's like a an infection spreading through bats in North America that leads to this fungus growing on their faces and uh, it's killing bats and it's like the the population of bats across Canada, the United States and I think down into like South America they're they're just plummeting and it's it's so bad that it's at a point that the government is taking all these extreme steps to protect the population um but in this case this family has a bat infestation in their home but you can only remove the bats two months of the year and under these kind of extreme kind of circumstances like you can't just put poison up there and kill them they're basically an endangered or protected species at this point but yeah you know, you know I, i've had mice in an apartment i've had a bee's nest outside my house that was awful both of those examples but having like bats showing up inside your house where there's kids sleeping and stuff that is terrifying flying rats yeah and it sucks that there's there's so little that they can do like mm-hmm. that must be i can't imagine how frustrating that is mm-hmm. and it's it I have this for... problem like you know the bats got into their attic or whatever the case is and mm-hmm. into their and roof and and hearing them in the walls and in the ceiling, like that's crazy. They're creepy. And not being allowed to do anything about it. Yeah. And I'm I'm all for protecting the species and looking after the bats. But it, it said like when it when they read the guidelines or whatever, you know, it could only be May or September that you can remove them and whatnot. Um, it said they will make under certain situations, they'll consider other months, like offering a permit to do it. And, and yeah, and that's the other thing. It's not only can you only do it in May or September, you still need to go through the process of getting a permit to remove them. But I think uh, yeah. having them in a private residence rather than, you know, the kind of commercial buildings attic or something. Uh, yeah, this is a situation where someone needs to do something. I don't know what it is. There has to be something that they can do for them. They can't just say, yeah, well, Sorry, there's That's nothing the bats you can house. do. There's nothing we will do, and there's nothing you can do. Nothing you're allowed to do. Because I would yeah. be, like, if it was my house and my family and my kids, I'd be so, um, I would want to poison them or something. But, uh, but yeah, you would want to because you want to protect your family. You want to protect your pets. Your house. And, uh, uh, yourself. I mean, you know, the diseases that bats can carry. Like, Oh, my gosh, yeah. I, I believe this family, they didn't mention it in the article, but I believe the family has all been treated for rabies because of how close they are to the bat droppings and stuff that are making their way into their house. That's just, just a nightmare. And, yeah, the expense. If you can't exterminate them, if you can't just kill them with poison or whatever, and you have to hire someone to... I guess like trap them and move the whole family of bats out of your house. That's not going to be cheap. So they have a GoFundMe where they're raising money to treat their bat infestation. Bizarre problem to have. Yeah. Well, a bizarre one, but a real one and real frustrating. I don't know. I can't, I don't know what I would do. In yeah. That situation. I feel for them. I, you would just, you would feel pretty helpless because they are. Like what could you do? It's like, yeah. you know, you have a just another example. You have a leak in your roof or something. You call a roofer, you get it fixed. You have someone come deal with the damage, you repaint, you solve the problem. But imagine you're like, you know, there was some kind of reason you weren't allowed to repair the roof. And they're like, you just have to let it drip, you know, and just, you're just going to live in a house that, you know, that's just dripping in there. I feel like it's you know, you'd feel awful, but I feel it's a pretty similar situation. You're just going to have to deal with bats showing up every so often. Uh, you'll have to clean up their droppings. You know, if they die in your walls, you're just going to have to smell them. If you hear them flapping around up there, that's just what your life is right now. Yeah. Yeah. And for the foreseeable future. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. yeah. I feel for them. My heart, my heart's out to the family in Saskatchewan dealing with this uh if there's an update that we come across we'll definitely share it but first we need to go to burnaby which is in bc burnaby bc to hear from another keep canada weird correspondent this is teresa who's going to give us a report listen to this good morning you wonderful people you this is my first time leaving a message for any podcast so Sorry if I fumble over my words a bit. I just have a story for the animal uprising. 
um, a toddler was walking in a park in Burnaby, British Columbia, and was attacked quite violently by an owl. His uh, eye uh, appears to be quite swollen, um, some markings. Uh, yeah, his father is calling for, demanding that the city, uh, his words, not mine, destroy the owl because it attacked his son when they were just walking along innocently. So, and then other people, of course, are coming back saying that the owl should not be euthanized. So, yeah, just, you know, them animals, owls included, getting more and more relentless on their quest to, be, to overcome mankind. And uh, just wanted to say thank you for being you. You both are wonderful, and you always make my day so much better when I see a new um, podcast has dropped. And love that it's you are Canadian, just like me, eh? Well, that was nice. Did that make you feel yeah. good? Yeah, it did make me feel good. Um, I I disagree with the father of the child demanding that the demanding that, that the owl be destroyed. Euthanized. No, he didn't say yeah, euthanized. destroy. Destroy. Yeah, destroy. I want to destroy him. Yeah. That owl must be destroyed. Uh, uh, no, the owl. Owls aren't to be trifled with. Uh, it's it's funny because when you're growing up as a kid, you always had this cartoonish perspective on owls. Yeah, like these they're wise old owls up in the tree. Like, and harmless, ooh, ooh. friendly, quiet. They just sit up there. and uh, Why wise? I've always thought of them wise. I, I really don't know where that comes from, mm -hmm. that stereotype. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and, and just innocent owls you know like that's that was always how i thought an owl was quiet minding its own business mm -hmm. but then in the past ever since the staircase documentary that oh, i talked here we about, go ad yeah. nauseum staircase people show. have a drink aaron <laughs> mentioned it you see the world <laughs> through the lens of a man who watched the staircase documentary yeah, no. There's also the scripted show too. The yeah, of course the dramatization. Tell the whole fascinating. So it's story. not just a documentary, but it's a but ever since life. then, when the owl theory came out of uh, the owl leading to the death of the woman, mm -hmm. um, it's made me realize how incredibly aggressive and violent owls can be, and you can just be. And we had the story. Was it last week that we had that uh, caller? Yeah, the, the, the caller who survived an owl attack. Yeah, and he said it felt like a baseball bat hit, hitting him in the back of oh, the yeah. head. Because these, like, they got sharp talons, but they also are big, heavy birds flying fast as can be. So it's like it's sharp, but it's like clubbing you. Owls are vicious. Owls are very vicious, and uh, I, I fear the owl now. Mm -hmm. I I never would have feared an owl before. Mm -hmm. Like if I was walking at night down a, a trail or a path or something pa past a tree and I look up and would see an owl, you know, five, 10 years ago, I, I never would have batted an eye at that. And now you'd run for your life, I assume. Now I would freeze in fear. Mm. And and probably get to my knees and beg for my life. Mm. Speaking of freezing in fear and begging for your life, I have a duo of stories related to death threats. Okay. But here's the thing. Yeah. One of them is uh, going to hit pretty close to home. You'll hear what I mean when we get to okay. it. Okay. Okay. Let's first go over to uh, Quebec. There's an interesting story there that is uh, pulled directly from the pages of the Keep Canada Weird playbook. Uh, we'll call this section of the show the salmon carcass threat. Uh, earlier this month, a 1994 Olympic gold medalist, a fella named Jean-Luc Brossard, uh, he went on public radio in Montreal to talk about um, a, a group of fishermen who were I believe illegally or yeah, I think it was illegally fishing 
uh, near his property. And he was on the radio talking about them and you know what they were doing. Uh, it seems that this group of fishermen heard him on the radio and they did not like, they did not at all like what he had to say. And they made no secret about it. Listen to this. So this is a weird story. Former Canadian skier Jean-Luc Broussard got a nasty surprise finding a dead salmon, the fish, in his mailbox days after he spoke out against illegal fishing near his home. The mailbox one was very surprising. This one really catched me by surprise. I was really not expecting that. Gary, having a face of a dead salmon with the rest of his body on the mailbox, I sort of made a step back and I kind of like yell a little bit. I bet. The Olympic gold medalist had gone on a Montreal radio station to denounce a group of fishers, he says, were poaching using a method called snagging. At nighttime, snagging uses a grappling hook instead of bait and lures, and it's banned in Quebec. Apparently, some listeners didn't appreciate his commentary. And like something out of The Godfather, he found, look at the, look what's in his mailbox. Gross. Like, imagine the smell. Rotting fish. A few others scattered around his property. Broussard said he'll keep denouncing illegal fishing and has reported this really weird incident to police. I think fish are gross when they're alive. Um, I think they're extra gross when they're like, you know, like cut up on a grocery in a grocery store, like in a tray wrapped in saran wrap or whatever. But none of that compares to opening a mailbox and finding a dead fish looking out at you. Yeah, uh, th I think that's a pretty clear message they left them. A very clear message. Yeah, stop talking about what we're doing. Yeah, and it's um, uh, I don't think it was just one fish in the mailbox too. They they just mentioned it offhand in the in that clip. There is um. You know, and others around his property. I think they threw a bunch of fish like up on his lawn and stuff, and stuffed one in his mailbox. Uh, that's pretty. I think that's pretty intimidating. But he didn't seem too worried about it the way he was describing it. He was on TV talking about it, so I don't think he cares too much. No, he said he's going to keep talking about it too. He's going to keep denouncing. Yeah. Well, uh, actually, this just puts it in the news. So it's the, the the fools. If they wanted him to shut up, um, they should have done something less uh, salacious, I guess. Yeah, I don't know what they could do. Just a friendly letter in yeah. his mailbox instead Excuse of a me. fish. Yeah. yeah. Just try, maybe try to maybe offer to meet with him and talk it out and show him the benefits of illegally poaching fish with a, with a uh, grappling hook. Grappling hook? So it sounds yeah. like... It's a very Batman thing to do. Yeah, well... It, in the news clip there but standing like looking if you look in the background behind where he's being interviewed there's like a river there where the water's going pr pretty fast so i wonder if what they do is they just put like hooks down in the water with the hopes of just like catching fish as they pass through which seems like it doesn't seem right but i guess what's the difference between that and like a net but uh, yeah i don't i don't really know enough about that to really yeah. speak to but the I guess proper way to, to catch salmon. Obviously, there's probably a reason that uh laws are put into place yeah. to ban that type of fishing in that area. Yeah, so, I'm gonna side with the fisheries people who understand the stuff and made that rule. Yeah, but obviously there are people who strongly disagree with the rule and are gonna continue to do that. Uh I just don't know enough about it to really speak too much on either side of that but be honest though you just don't want to get a fish in your mailbox uh if one of us is going to get a fish in their mailbox i hope it's you because hmm. i just can't deal with that right now well all right perfect segue again you've read my mind darren i didn't get a fish in the mail but i did get something perhaps as unsettling uh, we've been threatened before. Uh, people have tried to delegitimize the show by calling us a comedy show. Uh, people have um, slandered us by a variety of ways. Um, yeah, voicemails. We've yeah, voicemails. Threatening voicemails before. This is a first, though. I'm holding up in front of you right now. A well-decorated letter that just came to the nighttime Keep Canada Weird P.O. Box. The letter is on ornate paper, and I thought, wow, that's a really nice envelope. And when I opened it up, the envelope, it's just like someone took like the page of a calendar and like cut it up and made an envelope out of it. So that's, that's what's uh, very resourceful. Of yeah, them. very cool. And inside is 
a clearly homemade letter. It's on heavy cardstock paper. It says boo and there's a little pumpkin and it's addressed to Aaron and Jordan. The back of it also is quite ornate. So it looks like you would even call this homemade letter uh, a homemade card. Yeah, this is a homemade card. Yeah. And it says inside, Happy Haters Halloween. Now, before I read the letter, do you know what this is going to be about? Well, being that it's a homemade card, I think I know exactly what it's referring to. There was several months back or several weeks back no, i'd say i would say about three weeks ago or about, something like that about three weeks ago we talked about a sort of convention event that was happening in new brunswick that was kind of like the card makers guild and we cast some pretty heavy criticism specifically among the specifically directed at the woman who was hosting the card makers guild meetup uh, who bragged quite a bit about the quality of her homemade cards. Uh, we criticized, if not insulted her, but I think we probably touched a nerve with card makers across the planet as evidenced by this letter. Let me read you what's inside of it. Okay. So it says, happy haters, Halloween, Aaron and Jordan. I had to make this card for you because I know you'll hate it. It's cause you're special, you do you. Do you. I'm sure you'll both berate it. The hatred that you're spewing, I can't quite comprehend. What are these card makers doing to send you around the bend? I love creating things using paper and scissors and glue. I find it hugely amusing the way it infuriates you. I sent you hard earned money and find myself denigrated. It's truly uncommonly funny, a thing so benign, so hated. There's nothing wrong with any way you choose to show you care. You'd best be careful what you say of militant crafters. Beware. Yeah. What do you take this as? Uh, well, talking about, you know, showing you care and all of these things and then threatening us at the same time mm, this, in the same breath. It's fairly anonymous. It's addressed from Anne Nono San. Well, there's Ooh. probably only 15 people in North America that are making their own cards, so I'm sure we can narrow it down to who it is. Um, well, I'll give you a hint. They're in Oregon. So if you receive a suspicious package from Oregon with threatening language, maybe take your time before you open it. Militant I probably crafters. will send it to you to open because <laughs> you you apparently I had no problem with it yeah I have no issues with it opening up strange unmarked mail uh all but... jokes all jokes aside if it is a group of militant crafters who took who had a problem with what we said and they're doing the crafter equivalent of leaving a beheaded fish in our mailbox uh this is quite an attractive one this is actually a gorgeous card and without joking at all i will say this changed my opinion on card making if i get oh is that all it takes you know is what? that all it takes with you here's here's the thing let me talk about it um i come from a place of like or, or a background of kind of like diy um aesthetic you know like uh on underage uh, like rock shows and people passing out little zines and you know flyers promoting things or whatever this um this card had that aesthetic and it did seem like all of the paper used is sourced from different materials. So it has a little bit of a like ransom note vibe to it, but it's just very attractive. I will say I had a different feeling opening and reading this death threat than I would have on a traditional ransom note or a hallmark card that wrote like yeah we're gonna get you on it or something so uh despite the message clearly being violent i do appreciate receiving this well i just think that the sender of this letter is is missing the main point that i know that i had when we covered that card making story so what is it the main point was not specifically with the overall community of card makers it was just that one woman <laughs> who was in that 
news story mm-hmm. who w- was bragging and going on and on and on about how special her cards if are. If you get you know, a card from me, you know it's homemade. Every everyone bit of loves it. my cards, and <laughs> I would never send a pre-made card. Okay, did they get a card from me that's homemade? She had such an attitude and a pompousness about her that it just really pushed our buttons. Yeah. And so our main issue is focused specifically on her and not the entire homemade card making community. Yeah. I think that was the issue. We went like buckshot um, criticism towards her, but it then led to splash over into the card making community we should have had a more directed laser approached uh, she sucks, I guess, because this card maker, who I believe is named Ann, uh, you're good, Ann. I appreciate it. That's going to have a special spot on my desk. And the poetry was great, too. Yeah, the poetry was good. Um, yeah, I'll say this. You know, I appreciate the effort, although you're threatening my life and my my good friend's life. And your cats, certainly. And my cat's life, um, that's crossing a line with me. So I i am not going to take back anything I said several weeks ago regarding the card-making story that we covered here on Keep Canada Weird. I'm going to stand by everything I said. Uh, my word is oak, and an oak tree is hard to blow over. And, it's gonna... and, I, and your wind is not strong enough it's going to take more than a card maker's militia to change your opinion yeah yeah okay so anyway well you need to you need to make a card that has a mirror on the inside open up that card and look into it you think that would change it yeah they'll see themselves reflected back at them and Maybe think and realize about... that they have so many changes that they need to make in their life. <laughs> so many important changes. Um, let that be a segue to the story of the BC break-in that ends in a biohazard and a bathtub. This one I'm going to read to you. This is again, uh, it, it's short and sweet, but I just, I have to ask you what the hell is going on here. Let me go. Authorities okay. authorities are searching for a suspect who allegedly left a biohazard behind after breaking into a Kamloops BC business over the weekend. There's so many bees, a biohazard after a break-in in a business bathtub in BC. Um, anyway, in a news release, Kamloops RCMP said officers were called to a commercial address on 11th Avenue after a man allegedly broke in, defecated in a bathtub, and then fell asleep. The disgusting mess was discovered after an employee arrived at the business Saturday morning. The suspect fled in a blue Kia Sportage when a staff member knocked on the door around 10 a.m. Authorities said the suspect was described as an Asian man in his 20s, 5, 8 inches tall, with a slim build, wearing a light brown jacket or a hoodie, dark brown pants, black running shoes with white soles. Kamloops RCMP are asking anyone with information to contact them. So let me just say, when I first heard this story, I was kind of thinking maybe it was like a a drug thing or like um, maybe someone living in homelessness got into the business and there was no bathroom or something. But it ends with him getting in a car and driving away, which just like all of my theories were tossed on their head. Yeah, because if he needed a place to sleep, he would have just slept in his car. So what's he doing? Why would he? I would like maybe we need to know what kind of business it is. And usually, where there is a bathtub, there's a toilet not near, not far from it. Why would I had the impression that it was like the type of business that sells um, tubs and sinks and um, like a you know kind of a a business that sells those things. Why? Because there's a bath. Uh, every well, I guess not I every business would have a bathtub. That he, the bath cu- the bathtub that he defecated in was like a floor model. Okay, that was just how I read it. I don't know. Interesting. I didn't. I didn't make. I didn't. Because if that. he could have gotten into a bathroom, he would have. I think. Yeah. I'm giving this man the benefit of the doubt. I think he went in there for whatever reason. 
Mm-hmm. We can speculate for days about the number of reasons that would bring you into a business such as this mm-hmm. in the middle of the night. And the bathroom is locked. Mm-hmm. And he's the, like, bi- the business was it. open, but the bathroom is locked. Or he has a personal kind of... Uh, uh ethical kind of agreement with himself where i will only break one break into one door per night i don't know okay the more you talk about it the more the less it makes sense actually. i don't think it makes sense and then also he defecates in a bathtub and then chooses to stay there so if it's so like then this... maybe maybe he has a gripe with this business yeah i thought that out too but if he has a gripe in the, with the business, so he goes in and defecates in their tub, be it a tub you use or a floor model tub, you just leave after that. You've done your damage. Why would you then be like, and now I'm going to go to sleep here with my car parked outside? It doesn't make any sense to me. Okay, there's only one way. There's only one theory then that makes sense. Mm-hmm. And he was drunk. He was driving drunk. Okay. He decides, I'm too drunk to drive. So he pulls over in the nearest building that he comes across. Okay. This building is a business that sells bathtubs and sinks and fridges and dressers and beds and, you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, he's like, I'm going to, I'm going to stay there. I have nowhere else to sleep tonight. So he breaks in. Okay. And then maybe there is a couch near the tub. He lays on the couch and he's like, oh my God, I got to take a dump. <laughs> it's dark. He doesn't know where the bathroom is. Stumbles across a tub. He's like, I'm in this deep. I might as well take a dump in the tub. And he does that. And then he goes back to sleep on the couch. And then he wakes up and leaves. Maybe. I guess, like, what else could you... I can't think of any other explanation. That has to be what happened. Uh, There's no other explanation. They describe it as a biohazard. Um, the, the police do. Would any time it involves human waste, like, would that make it a biohazard? Like, when I first came upon that article... Uh, in that press release, I was thinking for biohazard, I was thinking like maybe blood, the guy had like HIV or something. Um, like, is I wonder if there's something special about what happened that would, well, you would go from e. gross from, you can get E. coli from someone's poop. Yeah. But then wouldn't every public bathroom like be a biohazard, but those things are being flushed. With the exception I, of people who wipe poop on the walls. I don't know. I you go to I've but been the, to a lot of gross public bathrooms. Yeah, I was at a Smitty's one time. The bathroom was a disaster. Gross. Um yeah. don't just don't describe it. But I won't, but like um I don't know. Maybe he ate something that was just god awful. Maybe it wasn't just a solid Okay. Normal. Okay. okay. Like maybe no. the, the consistency was <laughs> okay. such a. I don't want to hear it. Um, okay. I'm sorry I brought up this story. I hope they get the guy purely because I want to know what the hell happened. Do you think we're going to get the answer though? Even if they catch this guy, this is not and a story. Bring him to quote unquote justice. This is not a story that would have a follow up article. In November, no. we brought you the story of the biohazard yeah. in the past up in BC. 15 years ago, we brought you a story. <laughs> of... Yeah, I don't An think. An unsolved get... case. Yeah. <laughs> I think the closest the public is going to get to resolution for this story is what we just did. This is the deepest dive any news outlet is going to do into this story. Yeah. Yeah. I don't. <laughs> I have sympathy for this man, to be perfectly honest. <laughs> do you? It's a sad story. Who do you feel worse for, this man or the people who have the bats living in their house? In, oh, the people with the bats. Yeah. But, this guy's a close um, second. But I mean, haven't we all been in a situation where you're somewhere and then nature calls with an urgency that cannot be ignored, where... By the t- by, the amount of time it takes you to realize that you have to go to the bathroom, 
is the same amount of time that you have to go to the bathroom. Mm-hmm. So it's like, oh my God, I've got to go. And okay. I have to go right now. But then, and put- then you have to find somewhere mm-hmm. to do this at. And sometimes you have to get creative. Okay. But this just so happens that this one in a million nature calls and it's an emergency. Not happens- one in a million, one in 20. What? <laughs> it happens while you're breaking into a business with your car parked outside and you just so happen to fall asleep right afterwards. I just, I, I have a hard well, time. You don't know. That. You don't know because there have been times and I'll say it in my life where after I use the bathroom, where it was such an event <laughs> that I had to go to sleep afterwards too. Okay. Sober because I was like, I don't care what's going on in my life right now. I get to sleep for five hours after, <laughs> after that. Oh, this is my least favorite section of any episode ever. That's really rude. I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't th- I didn't expect us to get this uh, deep into this topic. Listen, you picked the story, man. Okay. You picked the story. So here we are. We're in the weeds <sighs> and we need machetes to get our way out. And sometimes that takes a while. Sometimes yeah. you have to hack away at a story. <laughs> if anyone knows what happened with this man, if they know him, you can either contact us and tell us the story first, and we'll notify the Kamloops RCMP and he'll be arrested. Or you no, can just... no, no. Actually, don't do that. Let's call out to the man, oh, yes. and we'll and have get him on the show, mm-hmm. and we promise him if he comes onto the show and tells us why this happened and what happened, we will not notify the police. That's a great idea. Okay. Yeah. If he contacts us, we won't tell the police on him. Exactly. Yeah. So he can get out of us telling the police on him by coming on our podcast, <laughs> telling his story. Um, yeah, that's what we'll Just do. between me and you, him. And keep and Canada Weird Nation. And the nation. And the animal uprising. <laughs> um, that all said, if any listeners have a theory on what this man had going on, if they have an explanation that hits all the boxes of facts we know about this story, we would love to hear about that in a voice memo. We could don't we could dedicate a full episode to opinion and theory on this story. I think um, we should. Yeah. So listeners, keep Canada weird correspondence. We want to hear from you. What do you think happened? And, and do you yeah. feel bad for him? And does this story strike the chord with you that it does with me? Mm-hmm. I think we can wrap this up. Yeah, let's uh, let's wrap it up because I'm so sick right now. <laughs> oh yeah, how are you feel? I hate having a cold, man. But you powered through it. You're a tough guy. I powered through, but it's like I haven't really had a chance to fully blow my nose and like do those things that relieve the pressure. So okay. it's like the pressure has been building the whole episode, and now okay. I'm just like. Oh, I don't have much left to give. Okay, well, let's get out of here. Handsome Aaron Airport. Until next time. Jordan, until next time. Um, Double check your candy. There could be what you think is a chocolate bar. could be a biohazard. Yeah, and Jordan, until next time, put saran wrap over your tub. That way you can, you don't have to worry. I want to thank you for helping Aaron and I fulfill our mission to keep Canada weird, but let us also call out to you for even greater support. If something weird happens in your neck of the woods, please let us know. Or if you have any comments, feedback, or opinions on any of the stories we covered, we want to hear about that as well. The best way to get in contact with us is via a voice memo at nighttimepodcast.com slash contact. We're excited to hear from you. Now I'm going to start wrapping up this episode, but before I do, I'm going to end with thanks. First of all, a big thanks to Aaron for sharing another evening with me and with you, the listeners of Nighttime. A shout out to the internet's favorite cult leader, Unicole, who provides the intro and outro voiceovers for this series, and Monty Dado, who provides the outro rendition of O Canada. And then lastly, but most importantly, a massive thanks goes out to each and every one of you listening to Nighttime, as without your interest and your support, this show would be as pointless as it would be impossible. And on the topic of support, let me thank the newest subscribers to the premium feed. Trish, Camille, and May Shell, thank you for going premium. And for anyone else who'd like to support the show, you can help us out here in a variety of ways. First of all, a premium feed subscription costs only a couple dollars a month, 
Now that money funds the creation of the show, but the premium feed also gives you the episodes two days early, gives them to you ad-free, and gives you access to a full back catalog of nighttime episodes. If that sounds like something you're interested in, you can go premium right now at patreon.com slash nighttime podcast. And even if you don't want to go premium, you can still support the show by simply sharing this episode on social media and telling some like-minded friends about the work we're doing here. We appreciate your support in growing the show. Now, I'm going to wrap it up, but until next time, take care of each other, hug your loved ones tight, and let us know if you see anything weird. Keep Canada Weird is written, hosted, and produced by the Nighttime Podcast. And now to our viewers and listeners everywhere, good night.